Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, this weekend we have I've shared with you the things, some of the things that the Lord has, has made me experience, has made me go through. I mean, the first night Friday, I shared with you my first visit, visit to heaven. And yesterday, my second. How many of you like the second visit to heaven? And how many of you are expecting that angel, that angel to pass by your place? Yes. Hallelujah. If you were here last night, you don't understand the angel we're talking about. Just ask your neighbor, what angel is it? Amen. Amen. We are in, that, in those days when God will, listen to me, we are in the time of the restoration of all things. You see, before Jesus comes, now look at this, come, to, come with me to Acts chapter, is it Acts 3, I guess, Acts chapter 3. Yes, verse 21. But let's start from verse 18, okay? But that's not my, but God was was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Now repent for your sins, repent of your sins and, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord and he will again send you, now listen to this, and he will again send you Jesus your appointed Messiah. And now Peter here is talking about the second coming of Jesus. He said he will send you again Jesus, your appointed Messiah. For he must remain in heaven until what? Look at your Bible. Huh? Until the time for the final restoration of all things. Now, before Jesus returns to the earth to take the church, this season is coming and it's already here. We are in the time of the restoration of all things. Now, do you know what it means, the time of restoration of all things? He says, as God promised long ago through his prophets. Everything that you see in the scriptures, everything that you see that the prophet of all had done, Jesus said, and that he told me live when I was in heaven on my third visit. Now, I'm going to tell you what the Lord said. He told me in a short time, in a very short period of time, God is going to restore all things so that Jesus might come. Amen? Amen. So, some of the things that you saw in the Bible, you saw the prophets of old do, God is going to do them again in, with the church in these last days. Amen? So get ready because we are stepping into the time of the restoration of all things. And in a short while, I'm going to explain to you what that, that implies to your life and to the church. Amen? So on my third visit to heaven, you know, every, every visit was unique. Now the first time I entered heaven through a staircase, you remember the angel was leading me. The second time, I was Caught up and then I found myself in front of a gate. That was a south gate. And the Lord Jesus was standing there and waiting for me. And he took me into the city on another side of the city. And began to explain to me the mysteries of supernatural supply and all of that. That we took time to explain yesterday. If you were not here yesterday, you better get this, the DVD and, and, and hear for yourself. Amen? But on the third visit, you know, I was caught up. And I didn't pass through no gate. And I found myself... At, at the foot of the throne. Now, the throne was something like this, but higher than this altar, you know. There was, there was uh, like steps, and the throne was seated, was somewhere at the top, and the angels were all bowing down at the foot of the throne. And when I was caught up in the heavens, I found myself lying down, pros lying prostrate at the foot of this, you know, like this spiral, and the throne was up there, and the Lord was waiting for me. And all the angels were bowing down. And I was there on the floor, my face down. And the Lord called me by my name and said, Nyango. I said, yes, Lord. And listen to what Jesus said. He said, when I called you to be my servant, I did not call you to take a book called the Bible to go and teach it to my people. And I said, what did you call me to do, Lord? He said, when I called you to be my servant, 
I sent you so you can go show me to my people. I said, Lord, I don't understand. And the Lord said, there is a difference between knowing God and knowing the Bible. And many people in church know the Bible. But they don't know God. And the Lord said, I want my people to know me, not know the book. You see, the book is there to help us know God. The book, you see, look, can I say this without blasphemy? If Jesus appears here now, we will not need this book. You see, when we go to heaven, we're not going to go to heaven with, our, with the book, with the Bible. There will be no Bible in heaven. Because the author will be there. And the Lord said to me, my people know the book, but they don't know me. You see, Jesus said it in John chapter 5. He told the Pharisees and the Jews. He said, ye search the scripture. I think John 5, 39. Thinking that through them ye might find eternal life. But it is the same scripture that testify of me. But ye will not come to me that you may have eternal life. Amen. It is the same scripture that testify of me. But you will not come to me to receive eternal life. But you cling to the scriptures. Now, I'm not on downgrading the Bible. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying that you don't need the Bible anymore. But the Bible is supposed to be the book that helps you get to him. You see, Jesus is alive. And he wants to have a living relationship with you. Hey, listen. You know, when I, I had the privilege of getting to heaven this many times, I realized God wants to have this strong and dynamic relationship with every one of his children. I'm telling you, look, Jesus wants you to see him today. Oh. Not when you die and go to heaven. No, now. He wants to walk with you daily. Talk to you like a friend talking to a friend. Like a husband talking to his wife. But you know what that, what, what that, why that is not happening? Because we are, that's not what we are looking for. I asked Jesus, but why is it not happening in church? He told me, because the church people... I'm not looking for that. They are not looking forward to that. You know, among your many expectations that you present to God, seeing him or meeting with him is not part of the expectation. You want other things. The church world over is hungry for gold, for silver, for marriage, for cars, for business, for money, and for promotion, for popularity, for power, and for whatever not. We want everything except him. And until your taste, your taste buds are converted, you will not see him. You know, God doesn't show himself to people who are not looking for him. And even when you, 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 you set out searching for God, he will not show himself to you the first day. You know why? You know why? How many of you know God doesn't wear clothes like this? No? Even in Adam, Adam and Eve in the desert, I mean in the garden, were not dressed in linen or whatever. You see, this that we wear, I even brag about my suit is super sankarant or whatever. It's, it's a mark of sin. It's sin that gave us this. Before sin, we did, they didn't have this. They were clothed in glory. And when they seen, the glory departed and they found that they were naked. So God does not wear clothes. You know when Isaiah said, I saw the, his robe filling the temple, he wasn't talking about cloth material. No, it was the glory of God. And you see, God doesn't show his glory just to anybody. Because seeing the glory of God means getting into God's intimacy. Or is, in other words, now, I'm going to use a language that is not very, may, may sound 
offensive to some of you. But you see, it is God will disclose his nakedness to you. And you must deserve it. That's why God will test you before he can introduce you into the secret place. You know, you know it's only stupid girls that will meet a man on the street and the man say, I love you, and they start removing, they start removing their skirts, right? Well-bred girls, like the ones I know back home, when you say I love you, she will ask you, what does that mean? You say, I really love you. You say, you're not supposed to be saying that to me on the street. And you say, how do I say? You say, if you love me, you go talk to my father. After you talk to her father, you say, go talk to my pastor. No? You have to go through all of that process before you can deserve to have her. And God will do the same. When you tell God, I love you, he said, really? And he will want to see how, how far you are ready to go. How much you want him. You know, that's why some of you, you start seeking God. After you've done it for one week, for one month, for three months, you say, oh, my friend, this thing is not working. You know why? God is, God is trying, testing your love. He wants to know if he can trust you. I mean, God is saying, can I open up my robe for you to see who I am? Amen. How many of you want to see God? Listen to me. There must be a hunger and a thirst, a desperation in your heart if you will ever see God. As a matter of fact, let me tell you this. Nobody sees God being in his comfort zone. You must step out of your comfort zone. You must go out of your way if someday you will ever see God here. Because he doesn't show himself to everybody. You see, the day Jesus, on the day of the resurrection, the resurrection Sunday, Mary went to the tomb when it was still dark. And when she got there, she didn't find the body of the Lord. And she left and ran to the upper room and told the apostles, told John and Peter, I went to the tomb and Jesus, is, the body of the Lord is not there. And the Bible said John and Peter decided to go to the tomb with Mary. You know the story, right? And when they got there, John ran, ran Peter. He got to the tomb and he stayed outside. He was looking from, no? And when Peter came, he went into the tomb and discovered the body of the Lord was not there. And the Bible said the two, the two men, when they saw that Jesus was not there, they left and went back to the upper room. But Mary did not go with them. She remained there at the tomb because she did not want to go without knowing where the Lord was. And the Bible says she kept crying and walking around the tomb looking for Jesus. And while she was crying, the Bible said two angels appeared to her. You see, when Peter and John were there, the angels were standing there. Because all the, text, the, the scriptures that tell you about the resurrection tell you that everybody that came there found the angels sitting on the stone and said, why you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he's resurrected, right? But in, that, in, in John, in the, gospel, in the account of John, Peter and John did not see the, the two angels. Mary saw the two angels and they told her, he is not here. And Mary said, please show me where you have kept him. You know, she saw the angels and she wasn't satisfied. Amen? And she kept searching and kept crying. And suddenly, a man appeared to her and the Bible says she thought he was a gardener. And she said to the man, please, sir, if you are the one that have taken his body, show me where you have kept, kept him. I want to go get him. And the man said, he's dead. He said, I want him even dead. I want Jesus so much. I want to be with him even dead. You know, some of us are looking for the Jesus that healed the sick. We want the Jesus that raises the dead and the Jesus that works miracle. But Mary wants him even dead. And while she was talking to this man, the Bible says he transfigured in her sight and she saw that it was the Lord himself. You know, the same grave, they went to the same grave on the same day. Three people, one saw the angels and saw Jesus. Two others saw nothing. They only saw an empty tomb. Oh. Mary was the only one that saw Jesus and saw the angels and the other did not see because she was the one that was desperate. 
The two others were too comfortable. And you know, these three are three kinds of Christians in the same church. You know, John is the number one kind that will come and stay outside. He doesn't want to take risk. He will not enter the tomb because he doesn't know what is inside. He will peep from. Even though he was said to be the man who, that Jesus loved the most, right? This is the dead body of his best friend. But he will not dare to get into the tomb. He will peep from outside. Then came Peter, another group of believers that will go just past that level and get inside. Peter is a little more courageous than John. He will get in and he will see that Jesus is not here and then he will walk away and go home with a report. Well, I went in. I even entered the tomb. I saw the, 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 his clothes on the floor, but I didn't see him. But there's a third group, the Mary group. That will not take no for an answer. They want God so badly, they're ready to give up everything. Amen? Now look at this. John is a type of the outer court believers. And Peter is a type of the holy place believer. And Mary, oh my God, is a type that will go into the inner chamber, into the secret place, and meet with the Lord. And she became the first that saw Jesus after resurrection. In fact, she even saw him before he went up. And when he wanted to hug him, she, he said, do not touch me because I still have to go to my father who is your father and my God who is your God. Well, go tell my brothers that you saw me. She saw Jesus before he went up. Why? Because she was desperate for him. <clears throat> you know the problem in the church, and I said it throughout this week, and I will say it, as long as you'll be seeing my face, I will be telling you this. Our problem is that we are not desperate enough. And even, let me even make it worse. Most of us here, we don't really love God. We only want the things that he will give. We, you know, like, the pastor is preaching and you say, well, let him finish preaching so he can pray for the sick. I came here to be prayed for. You know? And for you, service is not, was not good until they prayed for the sick. Until they prayed for people who, wants this, who want this or who want that. But you see, in these last days, God wants to awaken his love in the heart of his people. Amen. So coming back to the experience that I had, the Lord told me, I did not send you to go preach, to go teach the book. I sent you to go show me to my people. And I said, God, how, how does that happen? Show me in the scripture, one, a pattern in the scripture so I know what you're, what you're talking about. And the Lord showed me this scripture, Daniel chapter 2. Can we all go to Daniel chapter 2? Daniel 2 verse 46. The Bible says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar threw himself down before Daniel and worshipped him. And he commanded his people to offer sacrifices and burn sweet incense before him. King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face or bowed down to his face and worshipped Daniel. Brothers, King Nebuchadnezzar did not worship the God of Daniel. He worshipped the man Daniel. And he offered sacrifices of burnt offering unto Daniel. You know why? Because God created us as worship beings. And men are wired to worship. And whenever God appears before them, it, it doesn't matter in whatever form, they will naturally bow down and worship. And you know what? This day, when Nebuchadnezzar saw Daniel, he did not see a man. He saw God. And he fell down and worshipped Daniel. Listen to me. I was praying one day in the church. I was alone in the sanctuary, lying on the altar, and I was praying in tongues. And I heard the Lord say, Young God, why be contented with just being a preacher, a prophet or an apostle, or whatever you call yourself, if you can be God? Wow. Why be satisfied of being just reverend doctor, great apostle, if you can be God? How many of you know God is not intimidated by the divinity of his sons? He is proud that we become God. He made us to be God. Remember, Genesis 1, let us make man in our and after our own likeness. And that program has not changed. 
is still current. God still wants his children to be God. First John 4, 17, as he is, so are we where? In this world. You see, Psalm 82, verse 6, God says, I had said, ye are gods. You know, I was reading this scripture and the Lord told me there's a problem, there's, a, there's an error that you need to correct in this verse. I said, what is the error? He said, look at the way they, they spell. They, no, the, the people, the writers of the Bible, they were careful. They didn't want to create some confusion in our mind. No. And they said, I had said, ye are gods, and they wrote God with small g. And usually when we preach, we insist that this God is not capital G, it's small g. But the Lord told me it's, it's not correct. I had said, ye are gods. This God is supposed to be capital G. You know, and the Lord told me, are you not Nyangok? I said, yes. He said, is Shiloh Nyangok? I said, yes. He said, how do you do they write your own Nyangok? I say capital N, capital G, capital N, capital A, cap no? Capital letter, right? When they write his, Shiloh's name, do they write it with small n and small g because he's small? No, it's capital N. Huh? Shiloh is my son. Okay, thank you. No? When they write my son's name, he bears my name, and when they write his name, they don't write it with small n because he's my son. It's still capital N. But you know, whether they write his name, I mean, the fact that they write his name capital and doesn't make him me. So God said, I want you to be like me. That's why he said, as he is, so are we in this world. Listen, brother, God wants us to be everything that he is up there. And before Jesus returns, it's going to happen. Oh, I'm telling you, it's going to happen before Jesus comes. Amen? So, listen. For you to understand what happened in this text, you must know who Nebuchadnezzar is. Nebuchadnezzar, is king, in his days, was king of kings and lord of lords. Nebuchadnezzar was not the president like Donald Trump. No. He was not elected. He was king. As a matter of fact, Nebuchadnezzar, in his day, was God. You remember why Shadrach, Nyango, and Abednego were thrown into furnace, fire furnace? Huh? Why? Because they refused to worship Nebuchadnezzar's status, right? So Nebuchadnezzar in his day was God. People worship Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is known in the Bible to be the proudest man that ever lived this earth. Until God had to come down and humble him and make him an animal. No? Yeah. He, he, he lived with animals and slept on green grass for, he, for how many years? Seven years before God restored. After God had humbled him, God restored him. Nebuchadnezzar was, listen, he was the mightiest man that lived the earth at his time. He was not the president of a country. He was ruling the greatest civilization of that time. Other kings reported to Nebuchadnezzar. It is this great Nebuchadnezzar that fell down from his great throne and worshipped a little boy, young boy of 21 called Daniel. What would make such a great king like Nebuchadnezzar bow down before a young boy, small slave boy, Daniel, and worship him? You see, when Daniel and his friends were taken from Babylon, I mean from, from Judah to Babylon, they were ordinary young boys. They did not have anything extraordinary. If they had some powers, these people would not have deported them. No? Now, listen to me. There were thousands of them. Theologians said there were about 10,000 young, young boys that were deported from, from Judah to Babylon. When they got to Babylon, we only know the name of four of them. We don't remember. Nobody remembers the, the other 9,000 and something else. Why? Because when they got to Babylon, these other guys decided to conform to the system, and they decided to become Babylonians. Yes, yes, yes. When they got to Babylon, all these other guys decided to compromise. You know, the problem with the church today is we have a bunch of men and women that compromise. When we get into a setting, we, we just conform to the milieu. We live like the people, we talk like them, we do the things that they do. 
You know, for fear that we'll be either ostracized, rejected, you know, and all of that, persecuted, whatever, even mothered. But you know the devil is a liar. He will always tell you, look, if you don't say a little lie here, if you don't do this, if you don't do like this, you're going to lose your job. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. I'm still looking for those Christians that are ready to lose their job because they will not sign a wrong bill. You know, that, that kind of Christianity is long gone. Of Christians that will say, I would not, I would rather lose my job than sleep with my boss for nothing. But you know, so many people... I mean, Christians, I'm not even talking about the people out, out there. Christians, they would do all these things in their, in their offices to get jobs, to get promotion and whatever not, and they will come and testify and say, praise the Lord, the Lord. And sometimes they tell us the testimony and they don't tell us the real story behind. Now, I'm not preaching to you, I'm preaching to your neighbor, so don't get nervous. Hallelujah. But listen to me. These four boys, Daniel, Shadrach, Nyangok, and Abednego, when they got to Babylon, you know, I like them so much, I decided to put my name there. And you can do the same. You can put your name. When they got to Babylon, the Bible said they refused to compromise. And they said, we will not compromise. We will not defile ourselves. Listen to me this morning. I came to challenge you. Refuse to defy. As we get close to the last days, refuse to defy yourself. Amen. The devil will be putting more and more pressure on the believers. Listen, the devil will try to make things so difficult for the righteous. Amen. But that's what the Bible says. Only those that will persevere unto the end that will be saved. Amen. Amen. Please help me preach to your neighbor and tell him, Put up a strong face against the enemy and his works. Do not defy yourself. Are you preaching to your neighbor for me? Tell your neighbor, do not defy yourself. It doesn't matter the pressure. Refuse to compromise. You know what? If you refuse to compromise, there is a crown waiting for you at the end of the day. You see, those, those other boys that compromised and soiled and defiled themselves, they got lost in the crowd. Nobody's talking about them, and eternity doesn't know them. But you know, Daniel and his three friends that took the risk of not defiling themselves are the ones making history. Amen? Now, listen to me. When they got to Babylon, they were ordinary boys. And they took them to the school of witchcraft. Their classmates were the magicians, the astrologers, the diviners of Babylon. Now, this is Apostle Nyangok's interpretation of the scripture. When they got to school the first day, you know, Daniel was sitting on a bench with his classmate. And while the, the teacher was explaining whatever not that was, he was explaining on the board, this guy that was sitting with Daniel turned into a leopard. Daniel like, what? <laughs> you know, and then Daniel turned on to, to the other side and this other guy became a cobra. At, at break time, they, they had mesmerized Daniel and his three friends so much that they decided, guys, we need to talk to our God. Wow. Amen? Yeah. At the end of the day, Daniel said, look, we're going to give our God some days. We're going to talk to our God. Let's go and see our class prefect and ask him permission to talk to our God for 10 days. Now, listen to me. If you are a class prefect in a school of wizards, who are you? You are the senior or the chief witch, right? Or the senior wizard. Now, listen. These four boys went to see the class prefect who was the senior wizard and said, can you give us permission? Do not force us to eat the meat from the king's table and do all these rites or rituals that you want us to do. Can you give us 10 days to talk to our God? All you want us to do is to be intelligent and perform for the king, right? The man said yes. He said, so can you give us 10 days? At the end of the 10 days, you will test us and see if we can deliver the goods. And the guy accepted. You see, when the, when the, the Lord approves the way of a man, oh, he will cause even his worst enemies to be at peace with him. Look, God will make you find favor even in the sight of the greatest witch and the greatest wizard yes. because he is with you. Yes. This guy accepted. 
And the Bible says Daniel and his three friends decided to fast for 10 days. Now listen, what they call the Daniel fast, it was a light fasting. They were not completely cut off from food. They said, no, we will not just eat the meat that comes. We will not eat meat and all these delicacies. We will eat vegetable and fish and drink water for 10 days. Now, is that In Africa, we don't call that fasting. <laughs> huh? You know, all of these things that they do here in America, I'm fasting, I'm not drinking Coke. It's not fasting. <laughs> back, back home, when you're fasting, my friend, you don't even swallow your saliva. When the saliva comes, you spit it out. Your lips are dry. Your face is, your eyes are red. Your face is serious because you must seek God. But look at these guys. <laughs> Hallelujah. But these guys are doing a light fasting. You know, like they will not eat the, those, those, they will not go to McDonald's for 10 days, you know, and they will not drink Coke. But they will eat some vegetable and they will drink some water and they will eat fish. Amen? But let's look at this. 10 days at looking towards an earthly Jerusalem three times a day. At the end of the 10 days, when they tested these guys, they found them 10 times better. Now, my question is, 10 times better than who? Huh? 10 times better than the rest of the magicians. You know what that means? It means what the magicians could do, Daniel and his three friends could do it 10 times better. So if this guy can turn into a leopard, uh-oh, are you with me? If this guy can turn into a leopard, into a cobra, Daniel can even become 10 times bigger cobra than this guy. If not, explain to me how Daniel entered the lion's den and he was not eaten. When they threw him into the lions, then the guy turned into the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when the other lions saw, the Babylonian lions saw him, they bowed down and they said, hey, grand frere, Tila. <laughs> Amen. Now, look at this. After the 10 days of their fasting, Daniel became the class prefect. Because in the school of magicians and the school of sorcerers and witches and wizards, it is the greatest wi- sorcerer who is a chief. You can't be chief if you are not the, the, the highest. Daniel became the chief of the magicians and the sorcerers. Amen? Now look at this. Look at what 10 days of looking towards an earthly Jerusalem produced in the life of these four boys. What could 10 days of looking to a heavenly Jerusalem can produce in your life. You know, when they tested them, when the king tested these boys, my friend, there was no, there was no match. Amen? And Daniel was made the chief of the sorcerers. Then in chapter 2, the chapter 2 we just read, one morning the king woke up and he had a dream. And he called his magicians and he told them, look, last night I had a dream that troubled me And I've forgotten both the dream and the interpretation of it. And I want you now to use your magical art and tell me what is the dream that I had and what is the interpretation of it. And the magician said, oh, king, live forever. There is no king before you and there will not be any king after you that have ever asked such a thing from his magicians. Because there's no magician on on the face of this earth that can give you both the dream and tell you the interpretation of it. What you are requesting for, from us does not exist with men. It only exists with the gods whose dwelling is not among us. And then Nebuchadnezzar, and in that, do you know that they were right? They said right. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, if you cannot tell me the dream and the interpretation, then you have no, I have no use keeping you here, so I'm going to kill all of you. So the king signed a decree and said, all the magicians are going to be murdered. And they were walking away from the king's presence with their face down. When Daniel saw them. And said, hey guys, why are you looking gloomy today? They said, are you the only one that haven't heard the, the new decree that has been signed? He said, what is this decree? He said, the king said, all the magicians are going to be killed. They said, oh, relax. That's small. Let me go talk to the king. And he went to, the, to Nebuchadnezzar and said, hey, king, I'm, I'm told you want to kill everybody. What's the problem? And the king said, no, I had a dream. 
And I asked them to tell me the, the dream and the interpretation, and they cannot do that. So we will not continue keeping them here. We're going to kill all of them. Daniel, Daniel said, small thing. King, relax. Give me just a few hours and we'll be back. Remember, the magicians told him, what you are requesting for, it does not exist among men. It's only the gods whose dwelling is not here. So when Daniel left the presence of the king, guess what he did? He traveled to the place where the dream was. <laughs> He traveled to the world of the gods where the dream was and where the interpretation could be found. And he got it and brought it back to Nebuchadnezzar. When he came to Nebuchadnezzar and told him, hey, this is the dream that you have. And he gave him the, told him the dream and he gave him the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar said, this man cannot be, he cannot be a human being. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar fell down and worshipped him. Now listen to me. Do you know that Daniel was operating in what the Bible calls the powers of the world to come? Yeah. Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 4 to 6. Bible says, let's, let's check that scripture. Now, I'm going to give you some solid food today. Are you ready to die? Can you digest them? Huh? Now, if you cannot digest, Pastor, I see will help you after I'm gone to understand. Okay? So, if you don't understand something that I say and it's, 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 it's talk to your throat, to your throat don't, don't throw it out. Keep it. You will need it tomorrow. Amen? Look at Hebrews. Are you there? Okay, for it is impossible to restore. Thank you. Now, I like the screen. You know, so I don't have to see. For it is impossible to restore to repentance those who, number one, once were enlightened. Number two, those who have experienced the good things of heaven. Number two, those who have shared in the Holy Spirit. Number four, scripture man, who have tasted the goodness of of the word of God. Number five. And the powers of the world to come. And who turn away. Now when he, say, he talks about who turn away from God. He's, he means you can experience all of this being in this body of flesh. Are you here? Amen. Experience the powers of the world to come being in this body. Because there's still a possibility that you turn away from God. So Daniel was operating in the powers of the world to come. Do you know what the powers of the world to come is? In the world to come, we will not need vehicles to travel. In the world to come, we will not need visas, we will not need aircrafts to travel. In the world to come, nobody falling sick. We don't need a doctor. And in your Bible, besides Daniel, you have many others that have experienced the powers of the world to come. In the day of Elijah, he was traveling from nation to nation without passport, without visa, without etiquette. Huh? When Elijah shut the heavens three and a half years, Ahab looked for him everywhere he could be found. And when they told him, we saw him in Houston, Texas. Before they could close the borders of the nation to arrest him, they said, no, we saw him. He's in Algeria now. <laughs> By the time they called Algeria to arrest him, they said, no, we saw him in Togo. He was preaching somewhere in Togo. There was no nation where Ahab did not send his men to arrest Elijah. But from one nation to another, he traveled without et etiquette. That is the power of the world to come. Can I tell you something? Before Jesus comes to take the church, we're going to experience that. God is going to restore that to the church. You see your amen? The days will come when I will preach in, in, in Cameroon in the morning. And then I'll, I'll be preaching here in the afternoon. Yes. 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 Now, I'm not, I'm not teaching you some a new doctrine. It's Bible. Huh? Now, listen. When Moses went to the desert, Pharaoh was looking for him. I mean, they had given instruction to all the soldiers of Egypt. Wherever you see him, bring him here, dead or alive. 
Right? And then when God encountered him at the burning bush, the Lord said, go back. Moses came back to Egypt. Where did he pass through to enter Egypt? When, when, huh? Number two, when he got back to Egypt, he went to the palace. How did he enter? You know the security that is at the White House? How do you just appear before the king without a rendezvous, without an audience? Somebody said the power of the world to come. God said, go to Pharaoh and talk to him and he appeared before Pharaoh. Pharaoh was in his office writing and then all of a sudden, a man was standing there. The God of Israel has sent me to tell you, let my people go. And when he finished saying what God said, he went home. And Pharaoh confused, like, called all his bodyguards. Hey, did you see a guy here like this? He was wearing a white. They said, no, we saw nobody. The next day, God said, go tell him. And then he will appear before Pharaoh. He said, I was here yesterday. (laughs) (laughs) The, The time of the restoration of all things. Now look, Ahab looked for Elijah, Elijah so much that when Elijah met with Obadiah in 1 Kings 18, he said, go tell Ahab I'm coming. The man fell on his face and tore his garment. He said, why do you want me dead? We have looked for you everywhere on the face of this earth. And how can I go and tell my, my, my Lord that I saw you and when I will turn my back, the Spirit of God will take you to another place. Amen? And then he told him, don't worry, I'm going to see Ahab. And the next day, Elijah was in Ahab's palace. Ahab was in the palace. I don't know what he was doing. And Elijah appeared. He said, tomorrow, call all of your magicians and sorcerers and let's meet on the mountain. And Ahab obeyed. But Ahab did not ask him, hey, you Elijah, where are you coming from? We have been looking for No, 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 he didn't ask him. It is called the power of the world to come. And the next day, Ahab brought all of his prophets to the mountain of the Lord. I mean, to come here. And Elijah said to the magicians, okay, we're going to strike a deal. Let Israel know today that there is a God in heaven. And that I, Elijah, am his servant. The God that will answer by fire, he will be the living God. And you know what? Those magicians and those, I mean, those prophets of birth, accepted the deal. You know why they accepted the deal? Because they were used to doing it. They knew they could bring down the fire. They've been doing it in their services. So they said, small thing. Provided we are the ones doing it first. Elijah said, no problem. Amen? Amen. And then they went and they began to do, they began to enchant, they began to do all of this. And you know what? Elijah was walking there and teasing them. He wasn't praying in tongues like trying to bind them. No. He said, go ahead, cry some more, cry louder. Maybe your God is sleeping. He's gone on vacation. <laughs> you know why? Elijah knew two things. Number one, that his God is able to bring down fire from heaven. But number two, he also knew that his God could stop the God of these other guys Woo! from manifesting. <laughs> and these guys did everything that they knew how to. And no fire came. They, the Bible said they even caught themselves. And no fire came. And look at this. When Elijah finally brought down fire from heaven, all of Israel fell down on his face and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord. Listen. Jesus is not coming back to rapture a weak, weak, feeble, poverty-stricken church. No. Jesus is coming back for a glorious church. A powerful church. Listen. Listen. And this, the Lord told me, the church that I am coming to rapture is a church that will be ruling the nations. Listen to me. I prophesy to you. I mean, it's not, I'm telling you what the Lord said. Before Jesus comes, the church will rule the nations. Oh my God. I said the church will rule the nations. 
The prophecy of Isaiah that was repeated by Micah shall be fulfilled. That says it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be set on top of the mountain and on top of the hills and all nations will flow into it. That is the church that Jesus is coming to take. The Lord told me it is not this church that is full of weaklings, fearful people. They are afraid of sorcerers. They are afraid of magicians. You know, some of you, when they tell you your colleagues are Rosicrucian, suddenly you start praying in tongues. What are you praying in tongues? It's fear. No, look, if you are sharing an office with a Rosicrucian or a Freemason, hey! guess who should be afraid? The other guy should be afraid because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? Now, listen to me. Brothers, Pastor C, in one act of Elijah, he brought a whole nation back to God. Yes. One, one act, not two, one. Listen to me. This end time, the end time revival is not going to be a revival of crusades and stadium filling stadium. It's too small. I mean, we're talking about a revival where one man, it's not going to be many preachers. One, it was one Elijah that brought back the whole of Israel to God in one day. Now, this thing I'm telling you, the Lord told me, tell my church because I'm going to do it quick. And if you position yourself, you will be one of those men that God is going to do. Listen, one Daniel, brother, one Daniel. If you are, if you are, if you are a Daniel in, 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 in America and, and, and President Donald Trump is worshiping you, who are you for America? You are God in this place. Because if you tell him, hey, we need this to happen, he will push things around and make them happen. Daniel was, I mean, the king was worshipping Daniel. Daniel had become God for Babylon. And because of these four boys, the constitution of Babylon was amended four times. Look, after Shadrach, Nyangok, and Abednego came out of the fiery furnace, the king signed a decree. As from now, if anybody on this earth does not worship the God of Nyango, hey! you see, if you can make your nation come out with such a law, what do you call, how do you call that? It's called revival. Now, Bible said they will not all believe, but they must all fear God. Yes. The time will come on this earth where all men will have to fear God. Yes. Look, the evil you see out there will not always prosper like this. Oh, our nations are not always going to be run by people that are wicked, that are Rosicrucians. No, I'm telling you, before Jesus comes, the righteous will dictate God's law on the earth. Now, look at this. After fire came down, now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, nobody is moving here. And he took out his sword and he began to kill them one by one. Slaughtered this one. And number two was standing there waiting for his turn to be killed. And they did not run away. And Bible did not say there was a fight like some people were trying to escape. No. He, he kind of paralyzed them. Hey, hey, nobody's moving. He killed number one. Killed number two. Killed number 100. And nobody ran away. They were all waiting for him to kill all of them. Somebody say power. power. Look, God is going to restore power back to the church. Yeah. But you know, God is not going to give this kind of power to a church that is hungry for cars and shoes and money and husband. Look, oh my God. You see, God's problem is that he wants to give us things we are not ready for. And you know, God doesn't waste. So if you don't, you are not ready for it, he's not going to give it to you. It is written here, Jesus said it. Do not give precious things to pigs. Right? Is it written like that in your Bible? You know who are the pigs? The people that just want to eat, their nose is always in the air. They want, they're looking for food. They're looking for... And most of us are like that. We, all we want is the things of this world. We don't... Hey, my brother, do you know that the day you find God, you will stop needing any other thing? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, look at this. Can I show you something? You see, this thing I'm, tell, I'm telling you about Elijah is inside of you. Yes. Look at John chapter 3 and verse 8. Can you put up that scripture, John 3, 8? It's a new birth scripture, right? Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And he said, 
just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it, is, it, it comes from or where it's going to. So you can't explain how people, oh, no. No. No, that's not. What, what version of the scripture is that? Can somebody find me KJV? You know the KJV, right? Yes, the only authorized version. <laughs> yes, the wind blew it where it listed. Huh? Yes, can you read that for me? Yes. The wind blew where it listed. Yes. And thou hearest the sound thou, thereof. Thou hearest the sound thereof. But in not hell whence it cometh and whether it goes. Yes. So is how many people? Listen to me. Everyone that is born of the spirit has the, has the ability to travel like the wind. From the mouth of Jesus, everyone that is born of the spirit has the ability to travel like the wind. So you can be in Texas this afternoon and tomorrow morning you are in Libreville. And you don't, and you don't have a private jet. I know some of you may be thinking, is this not witchcraft? <laughs> but listen to me. The witches and wizards in Africa travel, every, I mean, they travel by, in, in boxes, like a small matchbox, 200 of them, they enter, there, travel to pa Paris, they go to Europe, they go everywhere, and do all of their witchcraft and come back the next morning. Now, listen, how many of you know that Satan is a counterfeit? Like he is the chief of it. And that he has not created anything. That everything that you see Satan do is a perversion of the truth. And the truth is in Christ. You see, God came to Philip and said, Philip, rise up, go to Gaza, to the street that is in the desert. And he didn't ask God how. I don't have a ticket. How do, how, do, how do I? No, he just got up. The Lord told him and he got up and he went. We, we, sometimes we make, we make fun of it and we call it Philip Air, right? But that Philip Air is in all of us. But just that like you are too heavy with eating too much hamburger and all of that. You can't, even when the spirit wants to carry you, you can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't fly because you're too heavy. Amen? This thing is in all of us. Il en est de même de tout homme qui est né. De l'esprit. So it is for everyone who is born of Tous the ceux qui sont nés de l'esprit ont cette chose en eux. All those who are born of the spirit have this thing in them. Mais it doesn't work for us because we are too earthly. We are too earthly minded. We are too we are too human. Ne marche pas pour nous parce qu'on est trop humain. Our desires is eating, drinking, sleeping and all of this. You see, the Lord told me I was in a 40 days and 40 night prayer and fasting time. You remember? That was 2014, right? Yes. I was, locked, I was locked up in my room 40 days and 40 nights. And when I, I came out on a Sunday morning and then I flew that same night to the US. When I got here, she couldn't make me out. I was like this and my hair, you know, I, I was not shaving. The last day, don't shave. Just leave everything grow. I mean, my hair was like this bushy, everything. When, when Yvonne saw me, he said, no, daddy, this is not you. I'm taking you to the Amen? But look, when I was in this 40 days, the Lord told me, there are three things that will stop believers from experiencing this dimension. You want to know them? How many of you want to know those three things? Number one, enemy of the glory of God. Bible calls it too much eating and too much drinking. Anybody that lingers around food is an enemy to glory. I'm telling you. Now you can disagree with me and that's okay. But someday when you make up your mind and you want to see the glory of God, he's going to tell you the same thing. You know, Jesus said, gardez-vous. Prenez garde de peur que vos cœurs ne s'apesantissent 
par les excès du manger et du boire. Jesus said, be careful else your heart will be taken by excess of food and drinking. That your heart gets weighed down by too much eating and drinking. The Lord told me, if you eat three meals every day, forget about seeing the glory of God. I'm telling you, take it or leave it, that's the truth. Now, that's not good gospel for Americans, right? But I will tell you the truth. Even here in America, if you know men that are walking in the supernatural and that are walking in this dimension, go check out. They're living a life of prayer and fasting. If you will not give yourself to praying and fasting, in other words, if you cannot see chicken on the table and say, I will not eat you, <laughs> you are not good for the glory of God. You can see it afar off, but you will never enter in it. I'm telling you. You see, Jesus took his disciples to the Mount of Transfiguration. Three of them, Peter, James, and John, right? When they got to the mount, Jesus began to pray and the three of them were sleeping. You know why they were sleeping? You know when your stomach is full? What do you do? I asked God, but when we eat food, it doesn't go to our heart, it goes to the stomach. And the Lord told me there's a, there's a direct line, connection between the heart and the stomach. You know why the Bible says that Gifts will corrupt the heart of a man. Huh? Because the things that you receive usually have an, an effect on your heart. Amen? Now, Jesus was praying and he was transfigured and his three disciples were there on the same mountain with him, sleeping and transfiguration did not touch them. It's not because you're on the Mount of Transfiguration that you will be transfigured by all means. No, you are not transfigured automatically because you are there. You can be there and miss the transfiguration. They were there and they missed the transfiguration. The glory came, covered the one that was, that was praying, and the ones that were not praying were not covered by the glory. The glory of God is segregational. Look, if you will not change your prayer life and your prayer pattern, forget about seeing the glory of God. Yeah. Wow. I, now, when I mean prayer, I don't mean this wishy-washy thing, like quick prayer, Lord, uh, in the name of Jesus, Next 10 minutes, Father, uh, bless my husband and bless my children as we go to work today. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people that get into the presence and they want to be with God. Yeah. Men that get into the presence and they shut down their telephone and they shut down everything because they want to talk to God. And they wouldn't mind staying there for hours if need be. So number one enemy of the glory is too much eating and drinking. If you give yourself to food, you will not see the glory of God. Pastor says. Of the three men that were on the mountain with Jesus, that were transfigured with Jesus, was Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Go, go, go find out. These three men have at least once in their lifetime fasted 40 days and 40 nights. There are dimensions in God you will never access if you are not given to prayer and fasting. You see, Jesus came one day and his disciples were trying to cast out a demon from one boy and they were not able, right? And then Jesus came and said, hey, you men of little faith. He rebuked the devil and the guy was free. And then later on the disciple asked Jesus, how come we could not fast, we could not cast out this demon? You remember the answer Jesus gave? What was the answer? This kind? Go ahead, not bed by. You know what Jesus was saying? He did not say when you have a demonic case, you must go first and fast before you come and do deliverance. No. He says, men who are, who are given to prayer and fasting access realms of power and realms of glory that make them walk on the head of some demons and some principality effortlessly. And when Jesus said that to them, he turned to the guy and said, hey, you, get out now. And he didn't have to say it twice. And the guy was delivered. You know, some people say, no, Jesus only fasted once in his life, 40 days and 40 nights, and that was it, and he never fasted again. Are you serious? Jesus was living a, a constant life of prayer and fasting. 
If not, he wouldn't have cast, he would have asked the disciples to come aside with him and fast before coming to deliver this child. If Jesus said this can't go not by prayer and fasting, it tells us implicitly that Jesus was a prayer and fasting person. No? In John chapter 4, when Jesus got to the city of the Samaritan and he was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, he sent the disciples to the city to go buy bread, right? When they came back and they gave him bread, he didn't eat the bread. And then the disciples began to wonder, has somebody given him food here? And Jesus told them, my food, I have a different kind of food that I'm eating. You know, Jesus told me, until you get to the place where purpose is stronger than pleasure, you are not ready for the glory. Until you get someday to the place where purpose is stronger in your life than pleasure, you are not ready for the glory of God. You must get to the place where eating food is not more important. You must get to the place where doing these other things are no more important if you want to see the glory of God. Now, I know this kind of message is not for everybody. It's just for one or two people here. But I'm preaching it for you. If you are just the only one, I'm preaching it for you. You see, because God said, I want you to preach this word everywhere you go. Because in every nation, I want to raise a Daniel and I want to raise an Elijah. Because God is getting ready to turn things around in the nation. And he's only going to use one Elijah like he did in Israel to bring a whole nation back to him. So it will not take a, a bunch of us like this. It's going to take just one. One man, one woman. Amen. Amen. Number two enemy to seeing the glory of God is sleep. If you are given to sleep, to too much sleep, forget about seeing the glory of God. Oh God, Psalm 63 verse 1, Oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul tested for you and my flesh longed for you in a dry and a thirsty land where there is no water to see your power and your glory. If you will see the power and the glory of God someday, you must walk out of your comfort zone. The Bible says of Jesus that every day he will leave his room why it is still is yet dark and he will go to a solitary place and pray. If Jesus had to do that every day, you, look, you want to do, ha ah, man, listen, you know, you remember I told you that all this started by the question, we started questioning ourselves, why is John 14, 12 not happening every day in our lives? You remember? You want me to give you some of the answers God gave me? The Lord told me, look, I want you to, he said, God told me, buy a brand new Bible. And I sent someone to go buy me a new Bible. And the Lord said, I want you to sit down and start reading from Gospel of Matthew. You know why God asked me to buy a brand new Bible? I asked God, why, why a brand new Bible? I have too many Bibles here. The Lord said, no, I don't want you to read the old Bible because you have painted and colored and underlined so many things. When you read the old Bible with the paintings, you will read it with the cliche of... So read a new Bible where there's no painting and there's no writing. So I bought my Bible and I sat down and I began to read. Huh? And then he told me, everywhere you see Jesus praying, pay attention. So I began to read. And I got to Matthew 14. And he told me, stop. You know, in Matthew 14, Jesus walked on water. Hmm? Go and see where Jesus was coming from before he walked on water. He had multiplied bread, fed the multitude. And then he sent the multitude away and told his disciples to cross over and go wait for him on the other side. And the Bible said, then he, 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 he moved from there and went to a solitary place to pray. It was three o'clock in the afternoon when Jesus went to pray. And the Bible said he prayed and when evening was come, he was there alone. So this guy began to pray from 3 p.m. And he prayed through 6. When the evening came, he was there alone. And he continued to pray from 6 to 3 a.m. Jesus prayed from 3 a.m. 3 in the afternoon to 3 in the morning. 12 solid hours, 12 straight hours of prayer, non-stop. Because the Bible said at the fourth watch of the night, fourth watch of the night is 3 a.m. At the fourth watch of the night, then Jesus went walking on water to go to meet his disciples. He had to pray that much to sustain him. Oh, my. Look, then he told, Jesus told me, 
For, for you to do the works that I do, you cannot do those works praying less than I did. If you want to work, do the works of Jesus, you must be able to pray as much as Jesus did. He had to pray the way he prayed to do the work that he did. Now you understand why the church is powerless? Because we are powerless. We are prayerless people. The world over, all Christians know that if you pray, the more you pray, the more powerful you become, right? That there's power in prayer. That the more you pray, more prayer, more power. Small prayer, small power. No prayer, no power. But Christians know it, but they don't pray. Prayer meetings are the least attended meetings in all churches everywhere. True or false? You know why? Because they don't know what is in the prayer meeting. You see these three guys that went to Jesus with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? If they knew that the transfiguration was going to take place that day, they would not sleep. And Jesus did not tell them that there would be transfiguration. He just took them to the mountain. You know, God has a sense of humor. Jesus will wake up every morning when it's still dark and he will go to a solitary place to pray. And I ask him, but Jesus, why will you go alone when you have 12 disciples with you? Why don't you wake them up so they can go pray with you? You know what the Lord told me? He said, I've tried waking them so much. They like sleeping, so I just... So, so, so in the morning when it's time to go pray, he will wake up at 3 a.m. and he'll watch all of them. They're sleeping. You know, and he'll even help cover them well. You know, towards the morning, it gets a little cold, right? Jesus will put the blanket on them so they can sleep well. And then he will silently walk out. To go and pray. You know what? If you can I tell you something? The day you make up your mind to go to this dimension, guess what? You're gonna be alone. That kind of this journey I'm describing to you is not a journey for everybody. Not everybody can go there. It's a journey for few people. It's a journey for people who are who can stand being alone, being abandoned by all. And Jesus was abandoned so many times by his close collaborators. He wanted them to pray with him even one hour. And they will not. He took them to the Mount of Transfiguration. They missed it because, they, because of sleep, right? Then he said, no problem. I'm giving them a second chance. Because our God is a God of a second chance. And then he took them to the mountain of, the Mount of Gethsemane. To, so that they could partake in his passion. And they still missed it. Because of what? Sleep. So sleep is an enemy. Can I tell you something, man of God? Hey, if you sleep, if you cannot wake up at least once every night to pray, you have been bewitched. <laughs> like seriously. If Jesus was waking up every night to pray when he was still dark, and you stay on your bed, and you want to do the business of the kingdom, you see, I've made Pastor C. It doesn't matter what time I go to bed. I will always wake up. Like here my program is, you know, we go home from here. Every day, every day, when I'm in Cameroon, every day at midnight, if you call me midnight anytime, I'm praying. Every day from midnight to 3 a.m., I am praying. It doesn't matter what I did in the day. In fact, I pray four times a day. From 5 to 7 in the morning, I pray. From 12 to 2 in the afternoon, I pray. From 6 to from 5 to 7 in the evening, I pray. And from midnight to 3, I pray. You must pray, brother. You, look, if you will step into these realms, you must learn to wake up. And look, even when I finish praying, if I wake up in the night for any reason, whether there was a noise or I felt like going to the restroom or whatever, when I wake up in the night by anything for any reason, it's a, I'll, even if I just finish praying, if I go back to sleep, and for some reason, I wake up. I'm going to pray even five minutes before I go back to sleep. Amen. Amen. Now, look at number three reasons that will stop you from entering the glory. The third enemy of glory. The Lord said familiarity and complacency will stop you from seeing the glory. You know, we become too familiar with God and the things of God. You know Miriam and Aaron attacked Moses because he married a black girl, right? And 
what they said was right. Moses was not supposed to, by God's law, Moses was not supposed to do that. And he did it. And then Miriam just suddenly remembered she's big sister. And she came to Moses and said, C'est pas parce que c'est toi le pasteur ici à l'église. Souviens-toi, moi, j'étais porté Remember, sur mon dos. Me, Miriam, I put you on my back. Maybe, peut-être qu'elle m'a attrapé l'oreille là. Maybe I was even pulling your ears. God got angry. There and there, God struck her with leprosy. Right? Moses fell down and begged God, said, please God, this is my sister. I love her. Forgive Miriam. God said, take her out of the camp at least seven days. And she was taken out. Do you know Miriam was a prophetess? Brother, check your Bible. After Miriam spoke against Moses, she never prophesied again. Her ministry was ended that day. You know what? You see, you see these men sitting here? They may be your cousins and your friends and your brothers. Be careful. You see, now I'm not saying, you know, sometimes we say that and they think we are lifting up man. But they are, God said, touch not. There's no way you can touch Pastor Asi and not touch the anointing. Because the anointing is on him. So there's no way I can touch the man without touching the anointing. You know, like they say back home, keep the real a problem. Leave problems alone. You see, if you see one of these men doing something that is not correct, hey, talk to who, who called them. Tell the one that called them, Daddy, I saw your servant. Too. <laughs> Let me tell you, can I, can I tell you something that is sound biblical doctrine? None of you here has competence or spiritual authority to sit this man down and correct him or rebuke him. You don't. And the day you will try that, I will not be there. Yeah, you know, sometimes, okay, you know, Pastor, can I say, can I say this? You see, we make ourselves simple and down to earth. And sometimes our congregation take our simplicity for granted. Yes. Now he will not say that to you because you will think he's saying so you can worship him. No, it's not about worshiping anybody. But you see, you must know we were all brothers in the church and then God called some to be apostles. God called others to be a prophet and then pastors and teachers and evangelists and doctors. And the Bible says nobody takes upon himself this honor except God calls him. You know, humanly we understand that. Donald Trump was a businessman, right? Yes. yes. And people could insult him when he was doing campaign. All the Americans could say whatever they wanted to say about him. Go and try it today. <laughs> After he has been elevated to that office, that's it. He's the president of everybody. You like him, that's okay. You don't like him. You are free not to like him, but you open your mouth and insult him, somebody will talk to you. That's exactly what happens with God. The moment he has called this man and his eyes lifted him up, that's it. And if you talk back against him, somebody will talk to you. You know, some church people feel that it is their responsibility to keep their pastor humble. Huh? That if we, we, if we, we honor him too much, it's going to go above his head. Look, your responsibility, your duty, your obligation is to honor your pastor. Amen. Bible says, give honor to whom honor is due. It's a, due. it's a debt you owe him. Yeah. You see me like this? You must honor me. Oh. You don't have a choice. If I'm telling you, and I'm saying that because I'm going tomorrow, so you will not see me. <laughs> but look, anywhere you see me, you must honor me. If you refuse to honor me, somebody will talk to you. When you see this man, you must honor him. Because you, he's a debt you must pay. It, God didn't say when you like your pastor, you, you, whether you like him or not, he's honorable. Guess what? 
We all here are not Republicans, right? Some of us here are strong Democrats. And look, if we had our way, Donald Trump would not be president. But if he walks in here now, we're all going to stand up. Why? It's not a personal. It's the office. We all stand up, Mr. President. Familiarity with God and the things of God will stop you from seeing the glory. Amen? Now, can I close this message today? I think I've given you enough, right? You want more? But look at this. Ten days. This, these four boys in Babylon were transfigured under ten days. How many days? Ten days of waiting on God three times a day. How many of you know after these ten days, Daniel did not stop the three times a day prayer watches. He continued, even when he became prime minister in Babylon, he would still pray three times a day, one hour each, 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 each watch. And you see, the problem with church days, some of you get too busy, say, no, I'm a businessman, my work, my this thing. Daniel was as busy as you can be, and even maybe busier than you. Prime minister in Babylon was not a joke. Yet, he will find time in his tight schedule to pray three times a day. Amen? Now, look, if 10, ten days could transform these four boys so dramatically and so radically. What can 10 days produce in your own life? Hallelujah. What if you decided to give God 10 days from today? Look, if you take out 10 days to see God, the world will not stop you. You know, sometimes we, we think we are so attached to our cell phone and you think if you shut down your phone for one day, the world will stop. The world will not stop. Few people will only call you, just a few missed calls, that's all. The world will continue. <laughs> if you die today, you think the world will stop? Hey, the pastor will die, they will bury him on Saturday. On Sunday, people will have church. So, if you are not here, this church will continue because it's not your church. So, if you decide to stop for 10 days, nothing is going to change around you when you come back and find the world where you left it. You know, I was telling my children, when we started this we, we, we went through a crazy time of fasting. You know, today, like, I've lost the reflex of eating. Sometimes, you know, I can stay two days. I've, I mean, I don't. I told my children, look, the chicken will still be on the market. And the fish will still be there. So that you didn't eat it today does not mean the chicken is finished. The chicken is still there. You know, when you decide to fast, suddenly the devil will make you feel like if you don't eat this chicken now, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Yes. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a king in your life called King Stomach. You must dethrone him. I, how, how do you know that King Stomach has a grip over you? Some of you here, sometimes you get so busy with your work, you can spend a whole day without eating and you didn't even realize. No? But wait until one day you decide, tomorrow morning I'm going to fast. And the moment you say, tomorrow I'm going to fast, then you get up in the morning and you go to work. By 10 o'clock, you are dizzy, you have headache, your stomach is biting, you are even trembling. You know why? Because King Stomach is demanding his offering. <laughs> Amen? But look at this as I close. 10 days changed the life of Daniel, Shadrach, Nyangok, and Abednego. You see, these disciples that were sleeping everywhere, Jesus took them to. He took them everywhere and they kept sleeping. Before Jesus left, he said, I know what to do. Oh, no, let me add this before I close. This bonus now. Pastor, excuse me, regard. Look. Jesus walked on the waters. Quand Pierre l'a vu, when Peter saw him, Pierre a dit, Seigneur, si c'est toi, he said, Lord, if this is you, ordonne-moi de venir. Ordain toi. that I can come toward you. Et Jésus lui a dit, viens. And Jesus said, come over. Pierre est sorti de l'eau, de la pirogue. Peter get out of the, the boat. Et il a marché sur l'eau. And he began to walk on the water. Un, one, deux, two, trois, three. Et puis après, il a commencé à s'enfoncer. And then he began sinking. Et 
On a souvent expliqué que c'est parce qu'il y avait le vent. And il a vu les vagues. We because he saw the wind, he saw the waves. Retournons dans le texte. Let's, let's go back in the test. Le vent était déjà là. The wind was already there. Les vagues étaient déjà là quand the Jésus a dit were already there when Jesus said come. Tu sais ce qui s'est passé pour que Pierre s'enfonce? Do you know what happened for Peter to sink in the water? C'est parce que la foi qu'on te prête, it's because the faith that is borrowed to you, ne peut te porter que jusqu'à un certain niveau. Can only carry you for such a time, le, for a given time. Le crédit qu'il avait dans son esprit était the, trop petit pour la qualité de truc. The, the, the faith that he borrowed was too small for the quality of the things that he was going to do. Le dépôt qui était en lui était trop petit. The deposit was too small. C'est comme si tu as uh, quelques centimes dans ton téléphone et you want to make a long call. It's like the credit on your phone is not much but you want to do an international phone call. Dès que tu lances l'appel, as soon as you start quelques talking, secondes après on te dit, after a few seconds say, your credit is not enough for you to carry this conversation. Yeah, marché un deux trois pas il a work, le crédit three, était, le, la réserve the, qui était en lui est finie. The finished. reserve was extinguished. La batterie est déchargée. The, the battery was out. Et Jésus lui a dit viens petit. And Jesus said come small. Et il a pris Boy, par la main. Boy come. And he picked him up by the Quand Jésus l'a pris par la main. So when Jesus picked him by the hand. Il a marché oui ou non. He walked yes or no. Ils ont marché avec Jésus pour rentrer dans la barque. He walked with Jesus to get back to the boat. Sa batterie était complètement à plat. His, his battery was down. Regarde encore une autre image. Listen something else, another Matthew image. chapitre 10. Matthew 10. Jésus appelle les, les disciples. Jesus called the disciples. Il leur donne le pouvoir de and guérir. And he gives them the power to toute heal maladie et all toute kind infirmité. of sickness and all kind of infirmity. Non? Et la Bible dit qu'ils sont sortis. And the Bible said they get out. Et ils sont revenus avec les témoignages. Même les démons nous étaient soumis en ton nom. Testimonies. They said even demons were submitted to us by your name. Quelque temps après ça. A few moments le, after, le papa later, a amené son fils qui était possédé de démons. This guy brought his child who was demon Les mêmes disciples qui sont sortis et qui ont vu les miracles n'ont pas pu chasser le démon. The disciples who saw the miracle were not able to cast out this particular demon. Tu sais pourquoi? You know why? Parce que la puissance qu'ils ont utilisée quand ils sont sortis. Because the power they used when they were out était une puissance d'emprunt que Jésus leur a donné. It was borrowed. It was given to them by Jesus. Jésus leur a donné une partie de son pouvoir. He gave them a little bit of his own power. Allez essayer voir. He said, go try it out. En français, on appelle ça la dégustation. In French, we call it testing. Tu sais ce qu'on appelle la dégustation? You know what testing is? Ça dit que tu vas dans le supermarché où on va like les parfums. Like you go to the supermarket. Où on va les parfums. Where they sell perfume, n'est-ce pas? Right? Et les gars ont sorti une nouvelle marque de parfum. So you went to a place where they sell perfume. Et ils vendent le parfum. Ils disent, oh, ça c'est un très bon parfum. And there is a sample that is sitting there. Hein? Et on peut même te, tu peux même essayer. On dit, you essaye. Know, they, they can put some of, they can give it to you. Say, try, try the sample out. Non. Have tu, you done tu, that before? Tu penses que le parfum là, sans publicité, c'est. So, so without any advertising. Ça s'appelle un grand nom. Les grands you know, noms de parfums que vous connaissez. It's a big name. Le parfum là s'appelle Nyango. Merci. <laughs> Merci mon gars. Tu as mis le parfum. That's the name of the perfume. Et le so, parfum sent bon. So you go and you put it on the sample on and it smells et tu, good. Et tu remets la bouteille and à la vendeuse. You have to put the bottle back to where it is. Et tu n'as pas acheté le parfum, n'est-ce pas? You don't buy the perfume. Quand tu sors de la boutique, et tu l'achètes. When you get out of the store, est-ce que tu sens Nyango? Oui ou non? Do you still good? Nyango hein? is still on you. Oui, yes tu or sens no? Nyango pour la you journée still, là. You still, you still smell good for the day. Et puis quand tu vas te laver, and then when you go, you bath, c'est fini. It's gone. Si tu veux continuer à sentir Nyango, if you want to still smelling Nyango, il fallait acheter la bouteille. Go buy your Nyango bottle. Donc ce que Jésus a fait, what does he mean? What Jesus did? Il leur a donné un peu de pouvoir. He gave them a little bit of power like this. Il dit allez essayer. He said go try it out. Ils sont allés, ils ont essayé. They went to try it out. Ça a marché. It was good. Quand ils sont revenus, when they came back, quand le père a amené son fils qui était possédé, when the guy brought his son who was possessed, ils ont dit oh non, nous on est les champions. They said oh we got we got young on. The thing we did yesterday. We can still do it. In the name of Jesus, get out. Demons say, "I'm gone." They say, "Demon, get out!" They say, "I'm gone." They shout it and all that. The demon is not gone. Demon say, "I'm, I'm here." Pourquoi? Why? Parce que le parfum, because the perfume, because the perfume that Jesus borrowed to them was over. Maintenant, regarde ce que Jésus fait. Now look at what Jesus does. Il a dit. He said, "La chose là que je vous ai donnée, the thing that I gave you, et que vous avez goûté là dehors, that you tried out there, il y a un prix attaché à ça. There is a price to pay for it. Et si vous voulez avoir ça, if you want to have it for yourself, vous devez être prêt à payer le prix. You got to be ready to pay the price. Et il les a pris, and he picked them up. Regarde, 
And look, look. Il les a enfermés dans la chambre haute. And he closed them up in the upper room. Et il leur a dit, vous restez ici jusqu'à ce you que vous stay here until vous soyez revêtus de la puissance. You are filled up with the power of God. Cette puissance là ce n'est pas une puissance d'emprunt. That power it's not borrowed. Non, chacun doit travailler pour avoir You got to part. work for your own. Regarde, tu, tu sais, you know, il n'y a aucun homme de Dieu sur la terre qui peut te donner, no qui peut te donner la double portion de son onction. Who can Ça give you pas. the double portion of his anointing? It doesn't exist. Ça n'existe pas. It doesn't exist. Mais attends, si moi je peux avoir la double portion so à te donner. If, if I have the double of my anointing to give to you. Pourquoi moi j'utilise une why don't I, why, why am I using only one part of it? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. La seule personne qui peut multiplier l'onction c'est the Dieu. The only one person who can multiply the anointing is God. Et si tu veux que l'onction se multiplie, and if you want it to be multiplied, il faut aller à la source. You have to go to the source. Tu sais, j'étais intrigué du fait que les hommes de Dieu viennent dans les conférences, dans les programmes comme ceci. On va, comme tout à l'heure, je vais prier pour vous et je vais vous expliquer ce qui va se passer quand je vais prier. I'm going to pray for you soon and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. I was concerned about men of God coming to conference like ma tête, this. They will put their hands over my les head. hommes de Dieu, parmi les plus grands dans ce This monde, my head that you see. Ont posé leur All of them have put their hands on it. Bonke a mis sa main ici. Bonke put his hand Yongi there. Yongi Sho a mis sa main ici. Yongi Sho put his hand there. Plusieurs d'entre eux que tu peux connaître. A lot of them have put their hands main. over my head. Le dernier, la dernière scène que j'ai vécue qui m'a choqué. The last one I saw that shocked me up. C'est Archevêque Ach- Duncan Williams. It was a, a, a Bishop Duncan Williams. On va vous communiquer le feu. We're going to give you some fire. Mais il faut que tu rentres chez toi. But your responsibility ta propre vie is de to prière, go home by your own prayer life. De discipline, your own life of discipleship. De de your life of fasting yes. and prayer will keep the fire. Continue de, yes. de souffler. Yes. You got to keep keep venting the fire. Je ne te promets pas que quand tu vas souffler deux jours, le feu va s'allumer. I can promise you that after two days it's going to be on. Tu vas souffler, keep doing it. Quand tu vas voir la fumée, when you see the smoke, les circonstances adverses, the, the adversity, qui vont te piquer les yeux, will come qui vont into te your eyes la like the smoke in et your throat. Et essayer de te faire arrêter ça. And they will try to quand stop you. Quand on va te dire la discipline, c'est trop dur. They will say it's too hard. Je ne sais si c'est trop compliqué. Fasting is too hard. Se lever à 3h le matin pour prier c'est trop difficile. Standing up at 3am to pray is too hard. Tu sais que le feu n'est pas loin. That means the fire is not far. Continue de souffler. Keep doing it. Parce que si tu ne t'arrêtes pas, because if you don't stop, un jour, one day, tu deviendras une flamme de feu. You will become a fire yourself. La, la Bible dit dans le Somme 104, le Somme 115, le Somme 104 verset 4. Somme 104 verset 4. Dieu fait de ses anges des esprits God made of his angel spirit et il fait de ses serviteurs des flammes de feu made of his servants fire Dieu veut flames. que tu deviennes une flamme de God feu want you to become a fire flame Dieu veut que ta vie ta vie devienne he un puissant ardent your life to become a burning bush Est-ce qu'il y a quelqu'un ici qui veut devenir un puissant ardent Anybody here wanted to be a burning bush Dieu veut que tu deviennes un volcan God wants you to become a volcano the moving yes. volcano Ce matin this morning il y aura éruption volcanique There will be a volcanic eruption Le in this place. De Dieu va faire the dans fire vie. of God will act up in your life. Et ta vie ne sera plus jamais and your la life même. will never be the same again. Est-ce qu'il y a quelqu'un ce matin qui veut recevoir le feu de Dieu? Est-ce qu'il y a quelqu'un ce matin qui veut recevoir anybody le feu de Dieu? Est-ce qu'il y a quelqu'un ce matin qui veut recevoir le feu de Dieu? Est-ce qu'il y a quelqu'un ce matin qui veut être contaminé par le feu de Dieu? 